Can you hear us, Matt? We hear him. Microphone's not muted. Hello? When I talk in my microphone, the dots go up, so it's reading it. Mm -hmm. All right. Oh, can you hear us? Can you? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Sorry, I'm a little technically challenged here. It's okay. You did a great job. We I can't. You I can't. First time we tried this too. Okay, good. I can't see on the screen though. What do I need to push to get the camera on? Or is there no uh, screen? You should be able to see. Do you see your own self at the bottom of your screen? No, I don't. So you're missing something because you should see us and you should see you side by side. Huh, okay. Let me see here. Uh, wow. No idea. <laughs> um, where would you click? Let's see. Where? Yeah, if you just move your arrow, your cursor around the bottom of your screen, you don't see any, any options to click on anything to see anything? No. It's, uh, let's see, at the top it has a, ca a camera, but it's the button to turn the camera off. So apparently my camera's on, but I can't see myself. Oh, yeah, we see you loud and clear. Oh, dear, okay. We do. All right, well, at least it's working one way. Well, we'll post. I'm so sorry you can't see us. Yeah, that's okay. Um, let me see if I can. No, that doesn't work. No. Well, I'm well, as long as you can see me, I guess we're good to go. Yeah, I'm gonna send you a picture of how it looks. Okay. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. Um, and well, welcome to the Trace program. Thank you. Of Luzerne County here in Pennsylvania, and our class is uh, very excited to see. I'm seeing the camera. Our class is very excited that you're here today because we've been focusing a lot on uh, mental discipline and how to push ourselves through obstacles and push ourselves through sometimes what are only self-perceived mm -hmm. obstacles, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm really interested in some of the techniques you might be able to talk about or some of the experiences you could talk about uh, to overcome some of those things. And then also, I just want to introduce you to one of our students, Mike L. Where's Mike? Mike is um, a huge MMA fan. We have several of them actually here in our class. Awesome. Hello, Mike. Hello. How are you doing? Good. So we're just going to let you take it away. Uh, we've introduced you and, and talked about you, and they got your bio and the whole nine yards. Okay, awesome. And they're just ready for you. Okay, well, let's go right into it. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I was thinking for a while what I would uh, talk to you guys about, what would be the most interesting to you. Um, obviously, I'm a combat athletics coach, mixed martial arts coach. I'm also a skeptic and uh, occasionally lecture and write on critical thinking and um, violence and personal protection but out of everything I think the thing is probably going to be the most interesting for everybody is if I talk about my martial arts experience and then uh, maybe offer a few a few things I've learned over the last 20 years that have helped me uh, get better and, and, and really enjoy the sport and the art and if that's helpful to you that'd be great and then I'll leave plenty of time for questions because uh, it could be an interesting topic, and I'm, I love to answer questions. So, um, just real briefly, I was born in Hollister, California, a small valley town in California that's pretty much famous for nothing except for the fact that it got taken over by the Hells Angels in the '60s. They made a movie about it, uh, Wild Bunch. And I was kind of a, a nerdy, uh, sensitive kid. My dad put me in karate. I think for that, I didn't really care for karate, but uh, that was my first introduction to martial arts. And then I saw a Bruce Lee movie, blown away. I uh, wanted to be Bruce Lee, and uh, that's really what kept pushing me into the martial arts. Uh, I graduated a little bit early, went to college for a bit, and then decided to go into the military. And uh, when I got out of the military, I wanted to—I really wanted to box. 
so I was I was focused on boxing at the time, and I was interested in a martial art that used boxing hand techniques, for lack of a better word, something that wasn't traditional karate, but where they had their hands up and they were using more of a delivery system, as I would say, that was boxing oriented. And that's what kind of drew me to what's called JKD Concepts at the time. This is all long before the UFC or the sport of makes martial arts existed. So this was this was a long time. Twenty, I don't want to age myself, but it was a long time ago. So I uh, found a JKD instructor in California, started training that Muay Thai, Filipino martial arts. I, I enjoyed it quite a bit at the time. Uh, wound up moving to Portland, Oregon. This was probably. 22, 23 years ago. Mm-hmm. Couldn't find an instructor here, and uh, couldn't find a school that did what I wanted to do as far as martial arts, but I did find a boxing gym, so I started training at a, at a place called Grand Avenue Boxing Gym here in Portland. <laughs> and then I ran across some other guys that also did uh, JKD. So but long story short, eventually we opened up a school together, which I managed for a year and a half, two years. Um, I was doing boxing. I was teaching Muay Thai and Filipino martial arts. And uh, I enjoyed it, but I started to see, uh, my philosophy started to get a little bit different. What I started to see was that a lot of what they were teaching uh, wasn't functional, in the sense that it was a choreographed pattern, and if, if somebody wasn't cooperating with you, it probably wouldn't work, which bothered me. Now, of course, boxing works, uh, judo, wrestling, uh, those kind of things, because you're working against somebody else that's resisting you. And if you don't have that resistance, you don't actually get timing, you don't actually get skill. You're just, you're just constantly repeating something without any resistance. It, it doesn't make you get better. The, the resistance really is the key factor. It doesn't mean you, you just put gloves on and go crazy because I develop bad habits and get hurt, but it's like lifting weights. You start with a little bit and then you progressively add more and more, but if there's no resistance when you're trying to push or pull on the weight, you don't get stronger. And believe it or not, I would say that the vast majority of martial arts, especially what we call traditional martial arts, they don't have that element in there, what I call aliveness. So I, I started to put that together and it bugged me and I wanted to do something different. And then the other piece, speaking of martial arts, that I realized having been in lots of schoolyard fights from having been a nerd when I was a kid, is that uh, most of the time in a fight, especially between two kids in a, in a playground, one person's, you know, going to throw up a punch or two and then one person's just going to tackle you and you're rolling around on the ground. So in other words, from my own experience, I knew that the ground happens, whether you want to be there or not, those headlocks and people sitting on you and that's what fighting was. And I also knew even though I was a boxer at the time, that was a huge weakness for me. So if I was to throw a punch or two and somebody really wanted to just take me down, I knew, again, before the UFC, but I still had that understanding in my head that that'd be a bad, a bad day for me. So I had this piece that was missing, and that's when I heard about uh, a guy named Hickson Gracie, which nobody really knew about. Nobody really knew who he was at the time. This, again, prior to the UFC, so I went down just to check it out, and he was doing a seminar in a classroom filled with a bunch of really big, much bigger than me, big judo guys. So these guys, these guys were grapplers. They were used to being on the ground whole room of them and he, he lined them up and he wrestled uh, what we call rolling full resistance you know pretty much do whatever you want try and try and beat me type thing one after the other after the other and he, he basically just dominated them beat them gently as if they were kids you know as if they were little kids including me at the end of the line there's no problem and I was blown away uh, at how awesome that was and that was my introduction to Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu or Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, and at that point I was I was hooked just because it's such a a fun and, and beautiful art and it's so functional. So it, it met that criteria I was looking for in the sense that it's real. It can't be faked any more than you can fake uh, being able to speak Spanish or play the guitar or being good at basketball. I mean, it's a skill that's testable, and uh, so I just loved it. I found an instructor here named Fabio Santos, a Brazilian man that was, at the time he was building, I think he was building surf, uh, surfboards or sailboats. Uh, he wasn't teaching. And uh, he was a black, happened to be a black belt under Hickson. And so I started training with him, and that was my introduction, and then that just kind of made me break away from the school I was with. I realized I needed to do my own thing. They weren't interested in, in going the route of makes martial arts, which is kind of what I was doing. 
and then uh, the UFC hit. I opened up my my own school. I opened up my own school in a little town called Kaiser, Oregon, right around the time or shortly after, a few months after the first UFC came out. Which, uh, if you guys haven't seen that, you can go rent them, and you'll see Hoist Gracie on there, and and uh, that was the world's introduction to to both mixed martial arts and to uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, Gracie Jiu Jitsu, and. Um, because I was the first to do it, and uh, I had uh, a little gym there, lots of people started to come, and that was that was a really good thing to see. Because when I first broke off and opened up my own school, I'll tell you that every single person in the industry that I talked to, friends of mine and other people, told me, you know, you're never going to be successful when you do this because people don't want to people don't want to actually roll around with resistance. People don't actually want to sweat. People don't want to get tapped out. Uh, you know, people want certificates, people want forms, people want this the image of martial arts, but nobody really wants to train. So in other words, you're going to be poor if you take that route, but go ahead. And I accepted that to be true. I figured that that's just going to be the case, and but I can't do it any other way. Because that's what I got to do, because that's what feels right to me. I can't teach people stuff that I don't think works. Um, plus, just Honestly, it's more selfish. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to get good at it, so I needed training partners. So despite what everybody was telling me, I opened up my own school and started training the way I want to train. And uh, and like I said, uh, thanks to the UFC and, and the publicity that started to come, it, it worked out great. So I, I had a big gym, started to, started to grow, uh, met Randy Couture. I'm sure the MMA fans in the in the room now became a friend of mine. We trained together for quite a few years. Dan Henderson, a lot of the a lot of the MMA fighters here from Oregon, uh, we worked together. And then, uh, terrible with dates, I don't remember exactly when this was, but I put out a what was at the time a VHS set called Functional JKD. Uh, and in that one, what I talked about was aliveness, the aliveness concept. And the aliveness concept was just a way. It's a one-word description to describe the difference between something that will work against a resisting opponent and something that won't. And the difference, if you look at the arch that you'll see used in uh, mixed martial arts, you're going to see kickboxing and boxing, wrestling, uh, judo sometimes, without the gi of course, and Brazilian jiu-jitsu on the ground, uh, and Muay Thai. And those are the things you see. And what those things all have in common is that they're sports. And the reason why the sports work is because in in sports, you're working against somebody that's resisting you. I mean, really resisting you. You go to practice, and you drill, and you drill, and you practice, and then you, and then you spar. And then when you go out to do the competition, you're actually executing the same skills that you're practicing in the gym or in the academy or the dojo. That's very different from traditional martial arts, believe it or not. So, And that distinction isn't so much about the technique as it is about how you train the technique. And so the word I used to describe that, to try and get that point across to people, um, was aliveness. And a lot of people liked that. They, a lot of tapes were sold. It, would, it was in the magazines quite a bit back in the day. Got a lot of publicity from that. So that opened up my ability to travel internationally. So I, did, I started to do seminars um, literally all over the world, all over Europe, France, Germany, Scandinavia, uh, Asia. Uh, Africa, in obscure, strange places like the Seychelles and Reunion Island, and the list goes on and on. So I, I got—I literally got to travel the world and have for the last probably 12 years, um, doing seminars and meeting lots of great people. Uh, and then about 12 years ago, I guess I got my black belt, my black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu from my coach, guy yeah, that's been my coach for the last 15 years, um, by the name of Chris Howder. Chris was one of the first American black belts. Great guy. Uh, we became friends when I first went down to compete as a blue belt in Los Angeles, and uh, I just liked his honesty. He's a very authentic, sincere guy, and he was also, at the time, um, one of the few guys, uh, men around who spoke really good English and was awesome at Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and, and would just give you the information. He wasn't trying to hide anything, so he was very open. So he was a great coach. He's been a great coach. He uh, awarded me my black belt. It was the first black belt in the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in Oregon. And uh, since then, I've 
the last uh, seven or eight years, I've, I've handed out nine of my own. So I have nine of my own black belts around the world who have, uh, some of them have become very good mixed martial arts coaches. Others are producing champions in jiu-jitsu. So I'm, I'm really proud of that. And then the last 17 years, I haven't had to have a real job, unless you count this as a job, which I don't. So I've been completely self-employed, able to raise my family. Um, I met my wife in Iceland when I was doing a seminar. She's Icelandic. She's given me two great daughters. So all in all, it's, I feel really blessed and, uh, and fortunate to have gone through this experience and, and been able to do everything I've done. So as far as, um, that's just brief biography and kind of my journey over the last 20 years. As far as lessons I'd have, I guess the first one, one of my favorite authors is uh, a gentleman by the name of Joseph Campbell. He was a professor and he had a really famous tagline he would give all his graduate students, which was, uh, follow your bliss. And that means something different for everybody, but uh, essentially what he was trying to say was, if you have something you're really passionate about, like I was 25 years ago about wanting to do something like mixed martial arts, pursue it. You, know, you may not be able to make a living at it. You may. Um, you don't know where it's going to go. But if, if it makes you happy and it's a healthy thing, make sure you don't let anybody get in your way and tell you not to do it. You, know, you have to go after it. If I'd listened to the people who told me I wouldn't make money at this, I probably wouldn't be talking to you right now. And I'd probably have a, I'd have a completely different life. I'd have, I'd have another job and be doing something totally different. So that's, that's an important lesson. And then the second thing that comes along with that, which might have, you know, get glossed over when I give you just a really brief description of, of all the awesome things that I've got to experience in the last 18 years, is you also have to really work hard. So the first probably decade that I, that I ran a business, I had to, you know, I was returning all the phone calls myself, teaching all the classes myself, running the business, because it is, in addition to just training, being a coach, I don't just get to walk on the mat. There's also, you know, I still have to run a business, which for a long time I didn't know anything about. So I basically had to do everything because I couldn't afford any employees. And, uh, you know, I wound up working long, long hours. So I have, I have four children, two uh, teenage sons, one's 18, one's 17, and two, two girls, uh, one's three and the other one's four months. So big spread there. But when my boys were were young, the first five or six or seven years, I didn't get to see as much of them as I would have liked. And that was because I was working so hard. So, And that's also true of, of jiu-jitsu. To get to the level where you can be competitive um, with really good people in jiu-jitsu, brown and black belt level, jiu-jitsu, you have to put in you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours against people who are really trying to choke you and, and put you in, in, in arm locks and things like that. And you have to tap Tapping is when one person puts the other one in a position where you know you've lost and you have to surrender. So you tap on you tap on them to say I give up. And jiu jitsu and the literal translation in Japanese means the gentle art or sometimes the efficient art, depending on how you translate it. And it, and it truly is because if you're good at it, you can control someone else on the ground without hurting them. So you can put them in a position where they can't really fight back, but you don't have to you know you don't have to hit them in the head or for you know cause permanent physical harm to them. So it's really cool that way. <clears throat> but in order to uh, get that skill, you have to be beaten over and over and over again. I can't tell you how many, it, it's uncountable, how many thousands and thousands of times I've had to tap out to people in order to get where I am. It's just necessary. So you have to work hard and you have to accept failure over and over and over again and keep coming back anyway because, back to my first point, because you really love what you're doing. You know, somebody that really doesn't love Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu isn't going to get good at it because in order to get good at it, you have to put up with that. You have to go through that process. It's impossible. You can't, sh you can't shortcut that process and, and be good because you won't have the timing. And so it, it really weeds out a lot of people that don't like it. But if you do like it and you're willing to work hard and put the time in, then it's not really work for you, and you don't care about getting tapped out. I mean, I do. I'm, yeah, I'm competitive like everybody else, and I still have that competitive nature. But at the same time, as soon as somebody beats me, I'm, you know, the next thing in my mind is, how did they do it? You know, I'm kind of curious, and it's kind of, you know, what you what'd you do? And I want to learn what they did so that I can beat them next time or so that I can, you know, pick up their, their technique. So it's a, it's a sense of 
competitive nature mixed with a natural curiosity and love for and respect for your opponent and how they accomplished what they did. So again, the first one, you know, really, if you have a passion, pursue it. And the second one is you got to know you're going to have to work really hard at it if it's worthwhile. Because anything that just gets handed to you or that you don't have to work hard for you usually isn't very valuable. But even if it is, we won't, we won't appreciate it. I know I won't. And then the last thing, which might seem really obvious to everybody, but it wasn't to me because I'm so stubborn, is you have to be willing to ask for help. So if I didn't have a coach, if I didn't have, for example, Chris Howder helping me when I was a young purple belt or blue belt, you know, I don't know if I'd be where I am today, and I, and I certainly wouldn't be nearly as, as accomplished as I am today because I would have had to, in a, in a manner of speaking, reinvent the wheel. I mean, jiu-jitsu is, is a science in the sense that it's based on physics and leverage. Um, and so if you're smart and you, and you really think about it, you can kind of figure out why stuff works and why it doesn't. But I'd have to, I'd have to figure out the whole thing by myself. You know, it would take a long time. Of course, when I have a coach there and I, I run into a problem, they can really help you out by just saying, you know, work on this part, work on this part, because they have more experience than I do. That, that was huge. So absent a coach, you know, I'm sure I wouldn't, I wouldn't be anywhere as good as I am now. And the thing that took me so long to figure out, for whatever reason, is something like business is exactly the same way. So for a long time, mostly because I didn't care that much about business, I cared more just about being good at jujitsu. But for a long time, I was just running my business, not really paying attention to, you know, marketing or how you do your billing or, uh, you know, the, all, all the thousands of things that go into running a business. And I realized I needed also a coach in, in business. I needed to pay attention to people who who were in my industry and also able to uh, be more successful financially than I was. And so I started to do that, and uh, mostly because I'm getting older and have to retire someday, but pay attention to them, and that's really helped me out. But it, it's true of, of everything. You, you, know, you always want to ask help for help anytime you can and not be afraid to ask for help from people who have more experience in, in whatever it is you're trying to deal with. Uh, and... Uh, that's pretty simple, but I guess those are just the three points that I would have. You know, pursue your passion, know you're going to have to work really hard, and never be afraid to ask for help from people that uh, have more experience than you do. So, yeah, that's probably a good place to stop. And then, if you guys have any questions at all on anything, fire away. Okay, so who has some questions for Mr. Matt? You just heard his speech. He talked about three things you can pursue and what kind of attitude you should have. So Jeremy has a question. Um, yeah. <laughs> Matt. Yes, sir. Um, you, that, that's your name, right, Matt? Yeah. Yeah, your name Matt, right? Say it one more time. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you. Matt, right? Come on. Come on. Come on. Your name, your name Matt, right? Yes, sir. My name's Matt. Okay, um, Matt, when I, when I was younger, I took um, I took karate and kung fu. When I was okay. Younger, and my, my, my karate team taught me um, a lot of disciplinary, uh, a lot of um, disciplinary actions. Um, when, 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 when to use um, self-defense and, and, and when not to use self-defense. So, he taught me a, a lot of disciplinary actions. Um, I brought, I, I, I two brothers. My two brothers took on karate and kung fu. Um, you know, so it, it, it was a, a big challenge for me because, you know, I, I, want, I wasn't used to um, having a, a teacher who taught me many um, you know, disciplinary a, 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 actions. You know, and my and my daughter and my daughter will, you know. So it it, it was a good uh, it was a good thing for me to learn um, karate and kung fu. So you know, so it, it was a big challenge for me. Well, good. Yeah, I'm glad you I'm glad you got something out of it and you enjoyed it. That's that's very cool. So, do you have a question? Um. Sorry if you don't. You can, if you don't have a question, you can take a seat. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks. Okay, so so 
Mike was next. Mike, Mike has a question. Mike? Yeah, Matt. Um, when you were in UFC, who was uh, your last opponent? When I was in the UFC? Yeah. I was never in the UFC. Oh, <laughs> no, no, no. I was a coach. Um, I'm a, way too old for that now. But um, we have the, the the best athlete we have now that's associated with us in SBG. Um, if you guys are MMA fans, is is a gentleman by the name of Gunnar Nelson. He's from our Iceland affiliate. Let's just call him Mjolnir, which is the name of um, Thor's hammer. Uh, he's a super nice young man, and he is uh, unbelievably talented in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. He had his UFC debut, uh, I think it was the UFC before last, when they were, um, I think they were in England. And you guys can go back and watch that fight, or just uh, Google or YouTube Gunnar Nelson, um, and you'll watch. Uh, and, and he's got another one coming up, I think, in February. And I would, I would tell you to keep an eye out for him, because... He's going to be he's going to be the champion, no doubt. He's going to get the belt. And in his corner, you'll see a, a kind of funny-looking Irish guy by the name of John Cavanaugh, who's one of my uh, he was actually my second black belt that I'm very proud of. He's a, an unbelievable MMA and Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu coach. So those guys are awesome, and and they're uh, and they're the ones that need to be representing that aspect of of SPG, and they're they're doing a great job. So so keep an eye out for him, and then uh, you know. You'll, you'll know where they came from. I think you'll enjoy his fight. And do you know of a guy named Jimmy Hattis? I do not. No, I'm sorry. Um, he was undefeated. He was like 5 0 by his last, his last opponent. And okay. The whole fight, he was like, it was at the end, it was an anonymous decision. Okay. Fight, he didn't look too good. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, that happens. It's a, it's a rough sport. It's, it can be hard sometimes. And the thing I like about. The way Goonie fights is because he's mostly a jiu-jitsu guy, what you'll see him do is take people down, kind of control them a bit, and then he usually finishes with a choke on the back, and, and uh, both he and his opponent will stand up, and neither of them is really hurt. So it's actually, it's, it's really cool, and I'd like to see, as, as a grappler, I like that more than I do watching people get knocked out or, or punched, but, you know, fans, every fan's different. Some, some people really like the striking. Do you, do you have a question, Mike? Uh, oh, okay. You wanted to ask about someone, maybe? You, you, you said you wanted to ask? Okay, so Nikki. Hi, Nikki. Hi. Hi. I have a question. Um, what kind of defense can you use when you, when you um, use matcha art? Because I was ready before, and I'm the kind of person that that's scared, and I used to run like a chicken. And when I was in high school, I I learned a little bit of martial arts, but not that well. My question is, how can someone like me use martial arts for? Just so I understand, your, it's Nikki, right? Yeah, well, Nikki. Okay. Nikki, just so I understand your question right, are you talking about use for self-defense? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So let me uh, let me talk about that real quick. Martial arts isn't uh, the, the best solution for self-defense. Um, the best solution and this is, again, kind of obvious, but um, it's worth repeating because I think that there's a lot of myths about martial arts. The best solution for self-defense is always avoiding places and areas where there's going to be a problem and being able to uh, stay away from people who, who would be interested in hurting you. I mean, most people who, uh, especially if you're a mature person and you're not, you know, you're not out in places you shouldn't be, most people who become victims, the, the person who's harming them is somebody that, that they know. And so it's really important that you try and stay away from people like that. And when, when there's people like that around you, you find someone else and tell them what's going on and, and get help. And that is the single most important thing. Um, and I, it doesn't matter who I'm talking to. I could be talking to a big, you know, I'm, I'm, a big I'm a big guy. I mean, I, I weigh 270, 280, depending on the, the week. So, But even a man my size, 
you know, if there's three or four, well, not even that, two guys that are really intent on, on hurting me, I, I would be in trouble, and I've been doing this all my life. So the, the trick is to stay out of, of, of bad situations. If you can't and something like that happens, jujitsu is great because you'll probably be on the ground, and all you want to be able to do is get away and uh, and keep somebody off of you long enough to be able to get up and get away. And if you train jujitsu for a long time, then you might be able to uh, to do that. In a worst case scenario, I have several uh, female uh, athletes in my gym. One of which is a world champion. She was the first homegrown. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu world champion from the state of Oregon, and another one uh, who will probably be a world champion this year, and she's also a mixed martial arts fighter. And both those women would be a nightmare for anybody who doesn't know who they are and tries to attack them. But they train four or five days a week. They're professional athletes. They're here all the time. And even uh, as skilled as they are, they know, because they, they train with men all the time, that uh, they don't want to be in that situation, and they have to, to try and get away. So, so you know, the the really the, the best weapon you have for defending yourself is always your mind. It's it's your it's your maturity, your ability to to predict maybe that you don't trust the person or that uh, you're in a situation where you shouldn't be, and the willingness to you know stand up for yourself and just say no and or get away. And as long as you do those things, uh, you're that that's way more important than. Uh, than being able to physically fight. Mm -hmm. I, hope, I hope that answers your question. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Mike. Mike, why? Hi, Mike. How you doing? Good. Uh, what weight class were you doing that? What weight class am I? I'm, again, let me let me just reiterate. I'm 43 years old, so I'm way beyond uh, com competition. But the last time I competed in uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, as a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu competitor, I weighed 221, and I had to diet really hard to get down to that weight. And the reason why I did it is because in Jiu-Jitsu, as soon as you get over 221, you're in what's called the unlimited weight class, and that means there's no cap on it. So I, I remember the first time I ever competed, I was probably 240, 250 pounds, and um, when I got to the finals, my opponent was 310 pounds. And it wasn't fat, mm. and that 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 was uncool. So I thought to myself, I'm gonna really lose that extra weight so that I know that the biggest guy I'm gonna meet is gonna be around 220 something, and not not 300 pounds. But now, well, first I don't compete anymore. But if I was, there's just no way I'd be able to lose 50 plus pounds to get down there. So I'm a, I'm unlimited weight class for the rest of my life. But I'm I'm also really tall. You know, I'm six foot eight, so yeah. um, yeah. I can't carry. How about, uh, who was your toughest opponent, Emmett, when you were fighting? My toughest opponent? Um, I've, the last match I had was uh, a no-gi, but without the uniform, grappling match with a guy, uh, I don't know what his last name was, but uh, um, his the name he would go by at the tournament, his first name was Ahmed, and he was famous leg, or was getting, was getting known for being a leg lock guy. He tapped out a couple black belts in the tournaments previous with what we call a heel hook, which is a twisting leg lock, including the one guy who's beaten me in jiu-jitsu, his name is Rico Rodriguez. He beat him in the tournament before. So I knew he was pretty uh, pretty dangerous, and I knew he was going to try and leg lock me. And I had a long match with him, and he did try and leg lock me, and I barely got out. And then at the last minute, um, I was able to beat him with a, what's called a triangle choke. And so I, I won that one, but that was that was a tough match. And then I, I uh, didn't actually realize that I had been injured until because of the adrenaline and because you were really warm. Until the next day, and I was limping for uh, probably a month or two after that because of he really did uh, kind of torque my knee. But but he that was a that was a tough match. That was the last time I ever I ever competed. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Do we have other questions? They were right. Concentrating as a coach, or any mental focus. 
Wow. Um, that's a very good question. I actually have to think about that one for a second. I think uh, the toughest things that I've had to deal with haven't been on the mat. They've been, you know, stuff that we all deal with, like um, the, the, the birth of my kids and, and things like that. And, and then situations that are pretty stressful, like that, then it can be very hard to concentrate. But being able to focus and concentrate on what needs to get done at that moment in time is very important because especially in uh, emergency situations like that, if you're not able to focus and concentrate, then you can't really be rational, and that makes it hard to make decisions. You, know, you, really, you, don't, want, you don't want to make decisions with your emotions, usually. Although it's good to pay attention to your instincts, uh, you have to be able to think rationally, uh, which is, uh, I know my friend Peter Bogosian, uh, I think, had a... Um, a conversation with you guys, and he's great at helping people learn how to think critically and, and use reason to solve problems. But the problem is, the issue is, if you're really emotional because you're scared or uh, frustrated or all the other things that all of us, including myself, have to deal with, then it's hard to be rational. So um, you have to try and calm yourself down. Uh, the jujitsu and the martial arts have been great for me in that sense because. It, it helps me do that in a lot of different ways, but uh, I think sports, and um, and it, it doesn't have to be jujitsu, but jujitsu is awesome for it. But there's all kinds of physical activities that that you guys can engage in. Uh, you have to find the one that you really enjoy. But one of the real benefits of athletics that I think a lot of people miss, especially people who who have gone too far over to the strictly intellectual side and no longer train in physical education is that sense of focus that you can get when you're forced to concentrate on something because it's physically very demanding. And if you do that long enough, um, because you enjoy it, and it, it is fun in the context of sports, because it's, it's, you know, it should be fun, then it will come out when you need it sometimes in life when you're having to make a tough decision and, you, and you, your mind wants to panic and then you'll maybe be able to focus more just because you've practiced. So, um, yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, good. Hi, man. I'm, I'm, I'm Jeremy. Hi, Jeremy. Nice to see you. Um, I, I, I do a lot of, uh, a lot of action moves at my, at my group home. And uh, my one, the one in the bathroom, the one karate movie I have, it's called the, the, the back to the back, where, um, where five, um, where five guys in the United States, they, 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 and, and, and uh, while, while I was watching that karate movie, you know, I thought, I thought, you know, what 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 it would be like to, you know, to be a to be a, a, a national, you know, thing, that national karate team. Um, what it would be like to be on a karate team? Yeah, I, I, after watching the movie, I, I thought, you know. Yeah, you know, if, if you watch something like that and you think, you look at that and you say, you know, that's something I would enjoy doing, don't be afraid to go try it. You might really like it and you never know. I would definitely encourage you to, to give it a shot for sure. Matt, can you talk a little bit, thank you, Jeremy, a little bit about you know, being afraid. Like, Jeremy's comment right now was great. He's like, you know, I watch these movies, and they're very motivational and inspirational to me, but I don't know that I could do that. I don't know if I could try to do that. Like, I just watch. Right. You know, like, how do you get from watching to getting the courage to do? Right. That's a good question. Um, I, 
I think the big thing that uh, a lot of people don't realize or don't understand is that, and I and I speak from my own experience here because, like I said, um, you know, I'm 270 pound, whatever I am now, and I've been doing this for a long time. But when I was a kid, I was really, really skinny, and I was super tall and really, really skinny, and I and I wasn't, uh, like I said, I was I was kind of a, a really nerdy kid. And uh, I felt the same way. I thought to myself, you know, I'm never going to be able to uh, to do that. I'm not that kind of guy. I'm not tough like that, and whatever. And then because I I was motivated because I thought it would be so cool, I, I tried it, and then I wound up sticking with it. But the thing that I realized was when I was young that way, and I thought about it, or even now I know a lot of adults who think about especially in martial arts this way, they think that if they get good enough or they train long enough, they're no longer going to be scared. The fear is going to go away and they'll, uh, uh, and they won't feel that. Especially, you know, if you guys have, have been in situations where you're scared or frightened about something or even excited, you'll get that feeling in your stomach, you know, people call it butterflies. And it's an adrenaline rush, but you'll get that overwhelming you know, it makes you want to throw up sometimes. In fact, some people do throw up. A lot of athletes before they compete will throw up. But And I had this idea in my mind, which I think a lot of people do, that if you train hard enough and if you train long enough, that will go away because I, I thought that that was something that was bad and you won't be scared anymore because I also thought that being scared was something that was bad. And then I realized uh, at some point that both were wrong. Um, that feeling you have in your body is just your body's way of preparing you for something that's going to be intense. It, you're getting more adrenaline in your system so that you can be stronger, faster, and more focused. It's a good thing once you realize what it is. And fear is a good thing. So we're all scared. I'm scared all the time of all kinds of stuff. So we're all scared of different things. And um, in, that's usually a sign of intelligence because you, you're able to recognize that this is a situation that, that scares you and that's also a good thing. It's just recognizing that there's nothing wrong with it, that it's normal and then if it's something that you really want to do or something that has to be done because you're in a situation where, where you, know, you have to take some sort of action, then you do it anyway. And I think the more people realize that it's okay to be scared, that it's normal to be scared, that these feelings and these uh, biological responses that we have are completely uh, normal, normative, the less they will be afraid to try uh, and, and, and do stuff. You'll, you'll do recognize, yeah, so you have butterflies in your stomach and you're scared, but you're not going to get hurt by, you know, if you go to take a karate class and the instructor seems nice and it's a beginning class and everybody's there, you're not going to get hurt. You know, it's not a bad thing. It might, it might be a really good thing that you're going to enjoy. So. You do it, just you know, and you and you recognize that uh, these these feelings and that fear doesn't mean you have to uh, to not do it as long as it's something that's healthy. So that's probably uh, the biggest thing I would offer. That's great. Now, what about the biological responses, like the butterflies or the feeling of being nauseous or the, or that? intense adrenaline rush that you get that does so many of those physical things to us. How do we move past that? Because, you know, we've got a situation going on as you're speaking here in our room where we have an individual, you know, who is having a, a tough moment. And she really wants to, she really wants to talk to me about that. But I've asked her to put that aside because it's not an emergency. Mm -hmm so that we can listen to you and gain all of your advice and your experience and then we can talk about it later but yet this person is kind of tied up and fits about it in their seat. How can a person like cope with that? How do you cope with that moment when your adrenaline is doing these things to you and your emotions so that you can move past it and press on with what you have to do? Wow, that's also a really good question. It's not an easy question to answer. Um, let me just say that uh, having coached thousands of athletes and, and been backstage at grappling and, and fights and stuff many, many times with different athletes, I just put it in that context because that's 
the context I'm most experienced in. Every athlete I know feels that and has that before they go into competition. Everyone. From Randy Couture, who is probably the coolest of all of them because he's done it so many times and because he's he really is, in a sense, a kind of a natural athlete. I mean, he, he competes because he loves to He competes for healthy reasons. He really loves it. So, But even he would, would you know, he would struggle before he would go out to the cage and, and, and he would have all those same feelings. Um, and everyone deals with it differently. I had one student years ago that uh, was a really good grappler. He, when he was with me on, on the team, I don't think he ever lost a match. He would go out and he would win. But every single time before he would go out, about five or six minutes before his match would start, he would have to run to the bathroom and he would vomit. He would throw up all over the place every single time. didn't matter whether or not he didn't have breakfast or whatever we tried. He would just get physically sick because the... The emotional experience was so powerful for him. Um, that was just his way of dealing with it. And then he would come out and he would compete and win and he would feel amazing afterwards because it was a huge trial for him. Other, guy, other athletes will listen to music. Um, others want to be around people that they trust or uh, that will distract them before an event. Others want to be isolated away from people um, and not distracted before an event. So as a coach, you have to find uh, how the athlete reacts best, and, and, and you'll make mistakes sometimes because you don't know. I mean, I, nobody can tell exactly without some experience and working with a person what's going to work best for them. But eventually, you figure it out, and you create an environment, hopefully, that's more conducive to offering as much comfort as possible before the event, and that's all you can do as a coach. As an athlete, you just have to realize, like I said, or as a human being that's just dealing with something like that, this is normal, that we all have uh, very various levels of how our body reacts to this. Like I said, I had the one guy who would you know, physically really throw up every other time. And then you'll have other people like, um, you know, like Couture, who I mentioned, who will pace the hall a bit, you know, he'll walk back and forth, but he doesn't, as far as I know anyway, he doesn't you know, get physically ill. So he, he just reacts to it differently. And I don't think there's a lot of choice in that part of it because we're kind of stuck with our biology. The best we can do is remember to keep telling ourselves in our mind that our reactions, biological reaction is okay. And we're just going to uh, breathe and work our way through it until the end. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, Jeremy, did you have a follow-up question before? Um, no. Yes, sir. You didn't. Uh, you didn't. You didn't. By doing um, the big martial arts and karate, uh, and karate, you know that it 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 it's wrong to do because you know you don't you don't know how to how to defend uh how to defend yourself at at, at certain times or um how to how to back down. So you know I I did I did I did have a question about. About um about about martial arts being being wrong and about um about fighting when 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 you're not when you're not used to being um a fighter. Okay, um, let me make sure I understand your question exactly. So you're asking about whether or not um martial arts, in specifically in my case, are helpful for being able to fight in self defense. Is that right? Okay. Um, it is, but again, the biggest uh, the biggest weapon, and I know this sounds cliche. It might sound like you know it's, I'm just saying it to because I'm I'm trying to be nice or or you know not lead you guys astray or whatever. But it is absolutely the truth that your best weapon is your mind. You know, if you if you stay out of problems and you can predict situations that might not go well for you and stay away from them, that in and of itself is a skill set. Like being able to fight physically, being able to recognize when, just to put it you know bluntly, when somebody's giving you the creeps or um, you know, pushing you in a way or towards something that you're not comfortable with. Being able to recognize that 
um, and being able to get away from that is way more important. So, you know, if I was, uh, for example, if I was a Secret Service agent, yeah, I'll, I'll answer the fighting part in a sec, but if, if I was a Secret Service agent, my biggest skill would be able to detect from looking in the audience threats, not not how, how well I could physically, you know, fight with them, but, but being able to predict it in advance. So when you're dealing with violence, being able to predict the situation in advance, whether it's the military or personal protection, is the number one thing. As far as physically fighting does it work, it, it does for sure. Um, it's, you, as an adult, you don't really get in fights, but with kids, it happens a lot. So with our kids program, um, kids have a lot of, there's a lot of problems in uh, schools in America. Excuse me, with bullying. Bullying is a huge issue. And I know from uh, personal experience and I know from dealing with the kids that sometimes if you don't stand up for yourself, I'm not going to say necessarily fight back, but if you don't stand up for yourself, they won't stop. And, and sometimes teachers and school administration officials do a very bad job of recognizing that and, uh, and they don't really crack down on the bullies the way they should. Uh, and so it's up to the kid, sometimes these kids are six, seven, eight, nine years old, to stand up for themselves. And sometimes that does mean having to fight. And in those kids' situations, we do whatever possible to avoid physical conflict. But if it comes to the, this is what we tell the kids now, but if, but if it comes to the point where you have to physically defend yourself, then you do. And jujitsu is really good for that because in that situation, um, they're able to control the person, um, hold them down, tell them to calm down, um, and, and usually that bully will never bother them again. And they don't have to resort to things like uh, punching them in the head or, or anything too violent. They can just, they can control, you can control a bigger, stronger person who's trying, you know, the full resistance to hurt you. You can get them on the ground and you can control them. So for the kids, it's really, it's really a fantastic tool. But, um, but again, as an adult, you know, if you're probably not apt to get in a fight like that. Um, and if you do and, and somebody's just attacking you, your best defense is always to try and be able to recognize those things in advance and avoid them. Thank you. So we have, you're welcome. We have a question from uh, Carol, actually, one of our co no, we, oh, Yes, that's what I'm asking. On the latter side, hi, I'm Carol, one of the program's assistants. Uh, tonight, um, I'm a coach too, and I have a big challenge. I have 30, 40, 30, uh, five to six year olds I have to teach ice skating. Okay, wow. going into battle. How can I psych them out and have them pay attention to me? Because it's really a challenge I bet you can't handle. Yes, that is a great question, and that is a huge challenge. Um, one of my black belts, the first one that come, came from my own gym named Travis Davison, has an amazing kids program and an amazing kids competition team. And a lot of the kids are around that age. And, uh, and he'll be dealing with groups that, that large and that age for competitions. And the, it depends on whether or not you're talking about a practice or a competition. But in practice, how old did you say they were? I'm sorry? Five to seven years old. Five to seven, okay. So the biggest thing we do is we basically turn everything into a game. Everything's a game. Now the games that we're doing are designed to give them skill sets that they're going to use in competition. So we're trying to figure out where they're weak or strong in competition, what we want to give them in competition, because we want to win. But the kids have no idea that that's what's going on. To them, it's a game. And the more we can turn it into a game, the more they're into doing it, um, and the more they get out there. As, as far as the, the actual event time, um, I don't ever really push kids during the event myself because uh, I want them to be self-motivated to want to compete. And if they don't want to compete publicly in front of in front of people, a lot of children don't like that. I don't want them to. So um, it goes back to turning it into something fun. And it, with jujitsu starting very early, like my own daughter now, she's three, and I'm training her in jujitsu. For her, jujitsu is a game. So she wants to do jujitsu. Hey, can we, Dad? Can we do jujitsu? You have to do jujitsu, and it's a privilege. So I always stop the, our our game, our practice before she wants to. So she wants to do more. Oh, uh, well, we stop. We'll do jujitsu tomorrow, or I'll turn it into something as a reward. So if you pick up your toys, we can do jujitsu. Oh, I'll do jujitsu. And then while she's practicing jujitsu with me, I uh, 
I praise everything and correct nothing usually in the beginning because I don't want correction for the really little kids sometimes in their mind it equates to the fact that they're no good they can't they can't do it so and if I do correct them the way I correct them is just by physically gently moving their limbs where I want them to be just kind of doing the action for them and then uh, over and over, over time they they kind of figure it out but I'm constantly hey good job it's nothing but praise no correction and it's all 100% a game and my only goal with my daughter and with the, with the kids that age is to get them to fall in love with the sport so that they will want to stay with it. Thank you. Thank You're you. welcome. You're welcome. So we did have two quick follow-up questions because our time ends in a few minutes as well and we want to be respectful of yours, of course. Sure. Class could talk to you all day, it sounds like. Great. <laughs> it's a great conversation and please take that as a compliment. Oh, no, I'm happy to do it. Uh, Mike? Yeah. Uh, I just had a question about when you were in this, either as a coach or an athlete. You know, you're building towards your fight day, but you've also got, you know, just for a number, six, say 60 days of training. So how do you focus on day one without paying so much attention to where you're going? Because I feel like, especially in this course, we want to get to the end, but we've still got so much work to do each day. How do you stay in the moment? Yeah, how do you build towards something and keep all the, like, the big picture in mind? I guess that's my question. That's a great question. Um, it takes planning. And and uh, what we'll do is we'll drop a, a, a blueprint. Sometimes I let the athlete know about it, or the class in this case, and sometimes I don't. And each practice is designed to work on a specific thing. Uh, and then, of course, it tapers down as they get closer to the event. Um, so there's a, there's a curve to it. And each individual practice is, in and of itself, considered a competition. So all they're focused on, or all I want them to be focused on, is today's practice. This is what you know, you're not worried about tomorrow. You're gonna, you're focusing on today. You don't worry about. I worry about tomorrow. I'm the coach. You worry about today. And they get into that habit. And so when they're coming into the gym, their only real concern is about their performance today. And I'll do the rest. Because you know, as long as they're doing the best they can today, then they'll do the same thing tomorrow, tomorrow, and the plan will work itself out because I've organized in advance how their training is going to go. Um, if, you're, if you're the coach and the athlete, so you don't have a coach to do that for you, it can be harder because it's harder to, honestly, it's very hard to compete at a good level if you don't have a coach like that. I don't know many people who, who uh, make it to the upper levels of any sport coaching themselves. Um, of course, you have an instructor, but you, you, you know, even if you have an instructor, you still need an athletic coach who's there for you, who's planning that, and who's running your workout. You don't want to do both at the same time. So I think it, yeah. And we have one final from Justin. Sure. Hi, Justin. Hi. Thanks for everything today. And final question, how do you suggest students improve their self-esteem? That's a really good question. Um, biggest thing I think for feeling good about who you are and what you're doing is it has to do with what you're actually physically doing so uh, a lot of times uh, when I'm dealing with people who might be athletes and other people who might be more depressed or going through some hard times and they're uh, down emotionally on themselves and uh, low self-esteem and, and uh, dealing with those kind of issues, the biggest thing I try and do is get them up and out of wherever they're at and doing something physical. And sometimes outside is much better than inside. But do something physical and tax the body. Um, get yourself to the point, get them to the point where they're very tired and they've pushed themselves physically. And you'd, you'd be amazed, or maybe you wouldn't, but it is amazing what a difference that makes. I know that's simple, but just exercise in and of itself does wonders for the mind and I know so many people who feel bad about themselves and who are really struggling mentally with different issues and you get them to do a good 45 minutes 30 whatever they can do whatever's hard for them at the time and at the end they feel better they feel better about the, who they are and they feel better about themselves and they just mentally the serotonin levels and everything mentally everything feels better for them 
and then stay busy in something productive. I know, speaking for myself, if I spend the day working really hard at something, whatever it is, uh, uh, at the end of the day, I feel much better about myself than if I spend the day just laying around. So although I certainly have days where I like to lay around, and if I had my, my way, I would probably lay around on the beach all the time, I know that after a short period of time, I, I would start to get depressed and, and have a sense of low self-esteem myself just because I would feel like I wasn't doing anything productive. And I think as human beings, we all really need to feel like uh, we're doing something helpful, that we're doing something useful, that we're doing something productive, that we're helping other people one way or the other, that we're helping ourselves, that we're trying. And when we feel that, whether we win or lose, whatever it is we're going for, when we feel like we're really working towards something, then we all feel better about ourselves. So the two-word answer for, for your question, I think, is take action. That leaves us on an amazingly positive note. We want to express our gratitude. Thank you so much for your time. It's been, our, it's been our joy and our pleasure, and we're very appreciative. Have a lovely afternoon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.